I wanted to introduce our last speaker of the day, um, Lisa Marie Castillo. She is a genetic counselor at Northwestern University. She started her genetic counselor career 20 years ago, doing genetic counseling in the MDA clinic at Northwestern Medicine, and then switched to focusing on cardiovascular genetics with a specialization in neuromuscular disorders with Dr. Elizabeth McNally 15 years ago. In addition to seeing patients for clinical genetic counseling, she has been involved in research studies dedicated to neuromuscular and cardiovascular disease and trying to identify new disease-causing genes as well as genomic research for the causes of sudden cardiac death. Lisa, thank you so much for being here on this Saturday. I will let you go ahead and present your slides. Sounds good, thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, so thank you so much for asking me to uh, be with you guys today. I hope it's been a great day and that you guys have learned lots. Um, so we are going to talk some genetics. Um, so I'm a genetic counselor at Northwestern. I've been, already, been doing neuromuscular disease for a long time. Um, but I'm going to kind of talk to some basic genetics. Um, and those of you not familiar with genetics, this should hopefully, uh, give you a good primer um, to go ahead and learn more from here on out. So the objectives, um, basically we're just going to talk some general genetics, inheritance patterns, um, genetic testing, and then we're going to talk a little bit um, about family planning. Um, so I just kind of want to start out by, um, this is a picture of a cell, and basically inside of our cell, um, there are um, all kinds of organelles, mitochondria, which are basically like the energy producers of our cell. Um, but the most important picture of this cell for what we're talking about is the nucleus, which is right here and in the middle. And then the DNA is the stuff that looks like kind of spaghetti in the middle. And that's um, what we're gonna be focusing on today. So if we break open the nucleus um, and look at the DNA in particular, this is a picture of our chromosomes. And basically the chromosomes are each um, little um, snippet or each little uh, piece, individual piece that you can see here. Um, and you see dark bands and light bands and that's actually the genomic information that's within inside of those chromosomes. And so that's what we're gonna be focusing on today. So if we were to cut out these chromosomes, actually when I was in grad school, they used to give us um, a picture like this and say, cut them out and figure out where they all go. Um, so I remember one Christmas break, I had that assignment and over Christmas break, I had chromosomes all over the kitchen table and somebody sneezed and they went and just went everywhere. And I was picking chromosomes up off the floor. It was um, awful, <laughs> but in any event. Um, so you can see if you actually sit and line them up for hours on end. Um, so we have two pairs of every chromosome. We have two chromosome ones, two chromosome twos, two chromosome threes. And you can see that each chromosome looks quite different from each other. Um, when you stare at them for long enough, you see that they look different. But the ones down here are smaller than the ones up here. So we basically have 23 pairs of every chromosome, or 46 all together. And then at the very bottom, we have our sex chromosomes here, which is X's and Y's. Um, People who have two X's are female. People who have an X and a Y are male. So um, we have about 20,000 genes um, on those 23 chromosomes. And our genes are made up of letters, A, T, C, and G. And so these letters are in a very specific order in each gene. And that's what basically tells us um, whether our genetic code is kind of what it should be or if there are changes in that genetic code. So if we break down what a chromosome is and does, we see that we have a chromosome and if we look at it more closer, we have the um, set of DNA or basically this is the double helix that I'm sure many of you have seen on different things. And our C's pair up with our G's and the A's pair up with the T's. Um, and then basically what happens is this genetic code gets translated into a protein. And the protein is actually what functions in our body. So it's not so much the gene that does the functioning, it's the gene making the protein. And then the protein is what's supposed to be actually functioning the way that it's supposed to function. If for instance, there's an alteration in a gene that actually results in a protein 
being made differently than it should, sometimes that protein doesn't work the way it's supposed to. And that would be called like a non-working protein. So this is kind of laid out in a different manner. So if we have, this is a genetic code of one particular gene, and I don't know if it is or not, honestly, I just made this up. However, this is essentially what a genetic code looks like. Um, when we sequence through the genes, it's a whole bunch of A, T, Cs, and Gs lined up in that specific order. And so say, for instance, if we are reading through our genetic code, and we're supposed to have a letter A here, but instead you have a letter G. Um, and the big thing is, like, does it actually matter or does it not matter? Um, and so the important thing to remember is that a lot of times, the vast majority of the time, that little change does not matter. Um, genetic changes in DNA, is, they're good. It actually makes us all different, which is fantastic. So the majority of the time, our changes in our DNA are fantastic and just genetic variation. If I were to look at my sequence compared to one of your um, entire genome sequences, the differences between my genome and your genome are about 3 million letters. So that's just general population variation. Um, overall, if we look at um, the entire genome, it's about 4 billion letters. So it's a lot of data that you get back if you sequence whole genome. And on the research side, we can do that. Um, but then people wonder why it takes so long to do research is because you're looking at 4 billion letters each genome and it takes a while. Um, so one of the things that we again try to do is figure out are these population changes in the DNA versus mutations or basically disease causing changes that happen. So when we're talking about these different um, changes or alterations within the gene, um, the ones that are significant, we call these days pathogenic or likely pathogenic gene variation, kind of the same as a mutation. So it's all kind of the same terminology, just different lingo. Um, but if something is considered pathogenic or likely pathogenic, it's an alteration in the nucleotide sequence of the DNA that actually causes a change within the protein to happen. And there's lots of different ways that these changes in the protein can happen. So one of them is that the protein length um, might wind up being shorter than it's supposed to be. So for instance, if a protein is supposed to be this long and it functions how it's supposed to in the cell being this long, but then if for some reason based on an alteration within the gene that does not allow the protein to be made this long, instead it's only made this long. Well, a lot of proteins can't function if they're shorter than they're supposed to be. They, ha they have to be the same, they have to be the right size to function normally. So if it's too short, then sometimes the cell itself can just degrade that protein because it doesn't recognize it. It just says, oh, I don't know what this is. It's just gobbledygook and we're just gonna toss it. And <laughs> so then you don't have the protein at all, which is usually a big problem. Um, or sometimes um, you might have too short of a protein but it can't do the function it's supposed to be doing. And so that can, that's obviously a problem too. Sometimes you wind up with proteins that are too long. So instead of it being this long, it's this long. Um, and if it's too long, then sometimes it can even accumulate in the cell or build up. Um, and then ultimately it winds up causing like malfunction later on because there's just too much like gunked up in the cell um, and the cell can't function over time like that. So that's kind of the length of the protein. Sometimes the protein is the same length it's supposed to be, but it's folded in a different way. So if the protein is supposed to be twisted one way, but then based on the mutation, it's twisted just a little bit different. And just that little bit different um, can actually result in the protein not working the way it's supposed to or not interacting with other proteins the way it's supposed to. And therefore you might wind up getting a disease from that. Um, and then um, sometimes the protein has a different charge to it. So basically the protein's the same length as it's supposed to be. It's folded the same way, but it's supposed to be positive and it's negative or something like that. And so therefore it's not gonna be able to interact with the other proteins again, the way that it's supposed to. Um, and then lastly, we can get um, what's called alternate splicing of the protein. So basically like, 
you might, you're supposed to have the length this long, but instead sometimes the protein winds up being this long, sometimes this long, sometimes this long, or this long. And so the cell just doesn't know how to process that. And so ultimately it's not able to make the protein work the way it's supposed to. So when we're talking about different genetic variation as being disease causing, these are all reasons why we can wind up getting a disease from a gene not working because it's not making a protein that can do what it's supposed to in the body, whatever that is supposed to be. Um, so this, I like this picture, especially to the neuromuscular world because um, this shows kind of the inside of a cell, gives you a piece of the inside of the cell. And these big red things are um, muscle fibers. And so they run through our cells and they basically contract and relax every time you kind of squeeze or squeeze your muscles. And so contract and relax. And so you can see these darker red fibers in here are what are kind of doing the contracting and then the relaxing. But you can see there's so many different components to it. You have these yellow fibers that kind of link them all together. You've got this very important dystrophin up top, this light blue, that kind of anchors the outside of the cell. Um, um, the outside of the cell proteins to the muscle fibers. Um, and then you have all these, um, this is kind of the um, interior or the wall of the cell. And you have all these important proteins too. And all of these proteins that are outlined are actually somewhat involved in neuromuscular diseases. Um, and any one of them not working the way that they're supposed to can result in a neuromuscular disease. So I think it's kind of fun to show too the neuromuscular population because you can really see like oh just that one I can now see why if it's not working the way it's supposed to you can actually have the cell not function the way it's supposed to as far as a muscle goes. So moving kind of a little bit on to the chromosomes and the genes so how we pass our chromosomes on or we have two copies of every chromosome like I was showing so this can be chromosome one on top two three and when our, we make our egg and our sperm cells, each chromosome splits in half, or not each, but the pairs of chromosomes split in half. So if these are the two number ones, one of the ones go into one egg or sperm cell, the other one goes into the other egg or sperm cell. So you wind up starting with 46 and you get 23 in each one. And then when the egg and the sperm come together again, you wind up 23 and 23, merge back to get your full 46 again. So we're going to talk a little bit about inheritance. Um, so autosomal dominant inheritance is the first kind of inheritance. Um, basically, it is um, um, it's where a gene mutation occurs on. I need to move this guy. Um, where a gene mutation occurs on just one of the two genes, and that is enough to actually cause symptoms to occur. So if these are our two, um, say two number one chromosomes. Um, one of them has a gene that's not working the way it's supposed to because there's a mutation. The second one is perfectly normal. It has a gene that's working. And this just having the one gene not working is enough so that we wind up getting the disease. And so when we pass on our chromosomes, if we have a parent who has a mutation on one of the two copies, the other parent does not have a mutation on, on either one, so they don't have the X's on either of theirs. But when they pass their chromosomes on or their genes on, basically the affected parent can either pass on the one chromosome without the mutation, or they can pass on the one chromosome with the mutation. So it basically becomes a 50-50 chance whether that gene with the mutation is going to get passed on. And then the un unaffected parent obviously is going to only pass on one without the mutation. So if you hear about a 50-50 risk, that's usually an autosomal dominant condition, um, and it's a 50-50 chance to pass that on. And this is kind of a typical pedigree that we tend to see with autosomal dominant inheritance. So the squares are males, the circles are females, and the colored in ones are the people who are affected. And so in dominant, excuse me, dominant inheritance, we see typically every generation being affected because of that 50-50 risk. Um, and we tend to see multiple generations who have affected people in them. 
So what gives you guys thinking for a second? Do you know any autosomal dominant conditions out there? Um, the most common feature seen in autosomal dominant conditions, not only is it that multiple generation, but we can also see a lot of va um, variability in how severe or how mild the disease can be um, in the same family. A lot of times autosomal dominant conditions are adult onset conditions. Um, and we might see one person who has the disease, but they have it much less severe than another person who has it in the family who's a lot more severe. So we do tend to see a little bit more variability with those dominant conditions. Um, some of the most common autosomal dominant, or not common, but some of the autosomal dominant conditions in the neuromuscular world that MDA um, does a lot with would be like Charcot-Marie tooth, uh, myotonic dystrophy, and some of the limb girdle muscular dystrophies um, are typically autosomal dominant conditions. Um, and then just as an example, um, with myotonic dystrophy, um, type one, I should say, um, this is a really quick, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on trinucleotide repeats, um, but remember our genetic code being made up of letters, um, myotonic dystrophy is kind of what we call a trinucleotide repeat disorder, where there's three letters, CTG, that are repeated over and over and over and over again. And we all have CTG repeats. That's just how the gene is made up. Um, but sometimes some people have way more CTGs than they should. And that basically, um, um, there's lots of mechanisms out there, but basically that makes the cell not work the way that it's supposed to when you have too many CTG repeats. But myotonic dystrophy is an autosomal dominant condition. So either the gene with the CTG repeats that have too many gets passed on or the one without gets passed on. And it's a 50-50 chance for being passed on. Um, so moving on to recessive inheritance. Um, so autosomal recessive is a um, little bit different than autosomal dominant. And I should actually say autosomal means, um, which I didn't say before, means it's one of the chromosomes, one of the first 22 chromosomes that are not sex dependent. So it's not the X or the Y, it's chromosomes one through 22. So when we say autosomal, it means it is not sex dependent. Sometimes we tend to see autosomal diseases, like we look at a family history and we're like, wow, kind of more females seem to have this than males. But it's not, that's just kind of random luck <laughs> or not luck. Um, it typically is the like, same risk for males and females. Um, whether you're a male or female, you're at that 50% risk for dominant conditions to inherit it. So autosomal recessive basically means that it is on a non-sex-linked chromosome. And the gene mutation has to occur on both of the two genes to actually cause the disease. So if these are our two chromosomes, you can see they both have X's on them. So they both have non-working genes. And then that results in the disease occurring. So when we go to pass our genes on, this one's a little bit more complicated because it's not just the you pass on the one without, with the mutation or the one without. It's you've now got each parent having that chance of passing on the one with the mutation or the one without. So each parent is what's called a carrier. Um, people in autosomal recessive diseases who are carriers, like these unaffected parents up here, they just have one copy of that gene being changed. They typically do not have the disease that we're talking about. Um, carriers, for the most part, go through life not knowing that they're carriers. And I think it's really important to say that we are all carriers to stuff. Like that's just human nature. So, and we don't really know that we're carriers because it's not doing anything to us. Um, and me pretty much most of the time, we don't know that we're carriers unless you have some sort of genetic testing before you get pregnant or when you are pregnant. Um, and it says, you're a carrier for this. Um, or if you have a child who then has a disease, then you say, oh, well now, okay, yes, I'm a carrier. But there's no way that you would have ever known that beforehand because carriers don't manifest any disease symptoms. Usually, I should say, let's just say usually. There are chances that they can, but sometimes, most of the time they're not. So um, for the two unaffected parents here, so if we kind of look at this first little bubble here, 
25% um, of the chance when two carriers come together, 25% of the chance they are going to have an unaffected non-carrier child, male or female. Doesn't matter if it's a male or female. Um, because both of those parents are going to pass on their chromosomes that are com or their genes that are completely working. No mutation in either gene. And then 50% of the time, these middle two bubbles, they will have a child who's a carrier, whether it be the carrier of the mutation from mom or the carrier of the mutation from dad. But either way, it would be one of the gene mutations that gets passed on. But then the other gene is working just fine. And so 50% of the time, they will have a child who is a carrier, but unaffected. And then the other 25% of the time in the last bubble, um, they will have a child who inherits both of their one copy of the mutation. So then essentially this affected child would have no working copies of that one particular gene. And then that would make them have the disease whichever disease it is that we're talking about. So um, do we know of any autosomal recessive conditions? Um, the most common feature that we tend to see in autosomal recessive disease is that they tend to be younger ages of onset. Um, some examples um, would be um, some of the limb girdle muscular dystrophies. Um, SMA, spinal muscular atrophy, is one of the most common autosomal recessive conditions. Um, so there's lots of autosomal recessive conditions out there. The last type of inheritance we're going to talk about is called X-linked. Um, so X-linked is a little bit different. Um, and I'm going to say specifically X-linked recessive. Um, this is a karyotype again, those little chromosomes I was talking about. And here we're talking about these bottom two chromosomes, the X and the Ys. So now we're getting into those sex chromosomes. So remember I was saying the difference between autosomal um, disease and sex-linked disease. So now we're going into the sex-linked diseases. So again, two X is equal a female and an X and a Y equals a male. Um, if we have a female with a mutation on just one X, so females, oops, females have two Xs, just one of her X's has this mutation, she would then be a carrier. Now in X-linked disease, sometimes females who are carriers can actually manifest some disease symptoms. That is a possibility. Um, for males, males only have one X, right? Because the other one is their Y chromosome. So if they have a gene mutation on their X, they only have one X. They don't have the second X to kind of compensate. So if you have another working X like a female, you typically don't have disease because you have this other X chromosome that's working just fine to produce whatever protein it is that needs to be produced. But males, they only have the one. So essentially they don't have a backup. Um, and so that is why in X-linked recessive diseases, males end up getting the actual condition that we're talking about because they, they don't have anything else to help them compensate. So when we're talking about um, inheritance, it's a little bit different um, because we have to think about males and females. And so it's not just kind of a straight up autosomal type of condition. So if we have a female or a mom basically carrying a next link condition, um, it passes on to both sons and daughters. So this is the mom here, XX. I have the, um, the X in green as being the one, say, with the mutation. And then dad has an X and a Y. He doesn't have the disease. And so dad's always gonna pass on his X if it's gonna be a girl. Like that's how you make girls. Actually, dads decide whether, he's, whether they're gonna have a son or a daughter because it's whether the dad passes on the X or the dad passes on the Y. So really, it's all about the dad. <laughs> um, oopsies. So um, if the mom, if we're going to have females, which are the kind of the half on the left, 25% um, of the females um, are going to be carriers right here, um, all the way to the left, because mom's going to pass on this um, X with the mutation. 25% of the females are going to be 
on they're going to not be carriers at all. So overall, none of the females will be affected, but some half of them will be carriers if you're just talking about females. When you throw the males in, 25% of the males will be, oh, I actually have this backwards, um, will be affected if the X is actually an affected chromosome. And then 25% of the males will be unaffected. So it kind of winds up coming down to which X mom passes on, whether it's the one with the mutation or the one without to the boys and whether we, they will be predisposed to having the condition or not. When we talk about males who actually have, um, males who actually have the mutation, they can end up having children. And so basically they cannot pass down their exes to their sons, right? Because the dads decide whether it's gonna be a boy or a girl. So if they pass on an ex, they're having a girl. <laughs> that, that's just how it works. Um, so they will never, males who have a condition will never have an affected child. They just, they can't. Um, all of their daughters though will be carriers because they're only passing on their ex with the mutation. So they'll have unaffected carriers, but then the males will not be affected. And then um, the most, one of the most common features in X-linked recessive diseases is that again, males are more severely affected um, and sometimes the only ones affected in the family. So like I said, every now and again, we can end up getting um, female carriers who have the disease, but most often they tend to not have it. So different examples of X-linked inheritance, the most common ones are Duchenne and Becker muscular dystrophy. Um, X-linked Emery Dreyfus muscular dystrophy is another X-linked condition that we think about. Um, and then I put this picture up here because it actually really nicely demonstrates how sometimes how proteins might not work the way that they're supposed to in the cell. Um, so this is an example of the dystrophin protein, which is what causes um, Duchenne and Becker muscular dystrophy. And so this is a picture of a muscle biopsy, which some of you might have seen. Um, normal is up top. You can see it's labeled normal. This is typically how a cell is supposed to look. It's supposed to have these, um, on the right-hand side, it's supposed to have these white kind of outer, um, 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 like white shading to it. That's the dystrophin protein. And so that's showing that this normal um, cell has a normal amount of dystrophin in it. For people who have Duchenne muscular dystrophy, which is the bottom panel, you can see that they don't really have a whole lot of white. And so that's that dystrophin protein not being made the way it's supposed to, and therefore that white's not showing up in their cells. So they don't actually have any populated um, dystrophin in the majority of their cells. And so it kind of shows you, like, when you have a protein not working the right way, how it can actually then manifest to cause a condition. And then Becker muscular dystrophy is kind of in the middle. They still have some dystrophin, um, just a reduced amount. So um, many of you might have had some discussions about genetic testing um, and what those discussions are like. I kind of just wanted to do a quick overview on like where to begin with genetic testing. Um, so typically um, it's talking to your neurologist or genetic counselor. Um, genetic testing can be done off of blood, saliva, cheek swabs, a whole bunch of different types. Um, I will say pre-pandemic, I was kind of just doing stuff off of blood because I don't know, I knew that saliva and cheek worked, but I was like just more comfortable with blood. And then once the pandemic hit, I was like, oh, and we're not going into the hospital, we're not doing blood. And saliva and cheek swabs work spectacularly. So I had something good came out of the pandemic, I guess. Um, and patients love it. They just do it in their homes and it's fantastic. Um, we always like to start by testing the person with that condition that we're looking at. Um, and that's because genetics is not always super straightforward. Um, and so we really need to interpret the results in the context of the person who's affected. So we always like to do that in the world of genetics. Um, and then if we actually find the pathogenic or likely pathogenic variant or mutation, 
um, we can then pass that information on to relatives so that if the relatives wanted to get genetic testing, they would then have the ability to do that. And we would just test for the particular um, genetic change that was found in the person with the condition, and then they could see if they're at risk or not at risk to have it. Um, so, so some benefits of having a genetic diagnosis um, kind of depends on the condition, but overall, it, sometimes it might clarify medical management. Um, for instance, so I do a lot with cardiac genetics and work a lot in the cardiology space. And so oftentimes we, we're asked, well, how can we figure out if they need to see a cardiologist or not? Well, knowing the exact genetic diagnosis, we would know, well, this gene usually does affect the heart, this gene doesn't affect the heart, and so it can really help guide whether they need to follow with a cardiologist or not. Um, sometimes having a genetic diagnosis can help clarify medical management options um, for some conditions. Um, again, if a mutation is identified, we can pass that information along to relatives who could also be at risk. Um, and then also it allows people family planning options, which I'm going to talk about next. So um, there's a few different options when a gene mutation is identified in terms of family planning. Um, so I usually like to say, um, you know, we can talk about um, family planning in terms of if you get pregnant the way you normally do versus not. <laughs> and so for this, if you get pregnant the way you normally do, um, there's options to do um, like a chorionic villus sampling, which is CVS, which is done at 10 to 12 weeks of the pregnancy, um, or amniocentesis, which is a little bit later, typically around 15 to 20 weeks of the pregnancy. Um, and these two um, are typically more um, just to have that information to know um, if the baby inherited the mutation or not. Um, and so it can get, provide you that information. Um, every now and again, it might actually change um, what you do in the pregnancy, but oftentimes um, it's more just to have that information and have it available. Um, and it, um, for some people that might also be options of termination if that's what they wish to do. Another option is basically don't get, the pre don't get pregnant the way you normally do but do this preconception. So pre-implantation genetic diagnosis um, gets done before you get pregnant. Um, it usually involves, or not usually, it does involve in vitro fertilization. Um, and so basically it's taking the, um, removing the eggs and fertilizing them in a dish, and then removing one cell off the embryo once it reaches a certain stage and then testing that embryo to see if that embryo has inherited the mutation or not. Um, and then you only implant those embryos that are negative for the genetic mutation that, um, that you're concerned about. So this is an option um, for people who absolutely do not want to pass on the mutation um, and also, you know, Pregnancy termination is not an option. This is a very nice option. Um, I think that is all the information that I have. Um, do you guys have questions? Thank you, Lisa. Um, we got a question that came in. What um, co um, collagen 6A congenital MD, how is mm -hmm. that? How is that? Is that inherited? It is. Um, it is talk about typically autosomal recessive. Um, yes, I'm fairly certain all of them are autosomal recessive, the six A ones. Mm -hmm. okay. And so you basically have two carrier parents. Two carrier parents, and then mm -hmm. okay. Right. I will say genetically, um, collagen six A has been. Um, tricky to sequence um, and so there's been some newer um, um, some newer sequencing techniques that I think have found more people recently um, to have that and so if it's something where you know you think oh well maybe I had testing 10 years ago and it was negative it might be something useful to bring back up and be like should we maybe retest because um, 
some newer developments have come to light. Okay. Will limb girdle 2C be passed on to my future children? Oh, limb girdle 2C. Which one is that? There's like a hundred limb girdles. <laughs> <laughs> I do Let not know. <laughs> no, I don't. Hold on. Let me look. Okay. Like literally, there's so many limb girdles that like you just can't keep them straight. Let's see. I mean, yes, because I think that they're all inherited. I just need to see what the inheritance pattern is. <laughs> Oh, you're fine. Oh, uh, let's see. Two C. Two C is. Let's see. Give me on two C. Hold on. Um. Do, 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 do. Oh, rats! I clicked on them. Hold on. Oh, yeah, that's um, so when I thought it was, that's an autosomal recessive. So that means that typically you'd see both parents being carriers. And so there would be a 25% chance that that would get passed on if um, the other parent is also a carrier. If the parent has them girdle 2C, um, then basically all of the kids would be carriers because they can only pass on they only have both genes with the mutation. Um, and so all their kids would be carriers as long as their partner is not a carrier. And so typically in situations like that, it might be a consideration to go ahead and test the partner to make sure that they're not a carrier because otherwise there could be a risk of 50% of having a child who's affected. But ask your genetic counselor for more information um, because they can look at your mutation and they can, you know, give you more precise um, information about it. Okay. Thank so you. certainly talk more to your genetic counselor or neurologist with that. Okay. Um, are you able to tell what gene your parent gave you? Is that possible? Um, well, you get 50% of your genes from mom and 50% of your genes from dad. <laughs> okay. This, so, this person is asking about another limb girdle, um, 2N. I really don't know what 2N is. Let me look. Okay. No, you're <laughs> um, but in any but in any event, um what um uh what was I gonna say? Um so it depends if it's autosomal recessive or dominant. Um but basically we get half of our genes from mom and half of our genes from dad. And so if oh go ahead. I was gonna say, wouldn't his genetic test results tell him? Her? Well, I was just going to say that. So <laughs> you would see what the mutation is, but the mutation wouldn't say you have an A to T at position 100, and this is a mutation, and you got it from dad. Like, we don't have any way to say, and you got it from dad, unless your dad then gets the genetic testing, and then we see, oh, yes, it was, you know, your dad has the same thing or your mom has the same thing. But there's no way to sequence and it has little flags saying, I came from mom, I came from dad, I came from mom, I came from dad. That That's not a possibility. So for people who unfortunately don't have parents who are living um, and for a lot of like adult onset conditions, that's the problem I run into because I'm testing 50 year old people who don't have parents who are sure. living. Sure. Um, so there's really no way to know what side it's coming from because the test result says this is what you have, but it doesn't say it's coming from one side or the other. So I will often in that case say, you kind of got to tell both sides <laughs> because we don't know where it's coming from. Um, if it's recessive, then it obviously is coming from both sides. Both parents were carriers, right? And so both sides are at risk. A lot of information. <laughs> I know. Not so easy. I hope that answers. No, your it's not. For the limb girdle to end. Yeah, I for believe the, it did. Yeah. I did not see anything else that has popped up. So thank you so much, Lisa. Oh, wait a second. Hold on. <laughs> oh, something just hopped in. It says, can diet have any repair effects to affected genes? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so, not that we have a good understanding of right now, okay. um, as far as it repairing genes. Um, there are a lot of 
what are called like epigenetic factors that go into genetics where different things, different outside influences can affect how genes work. Mm -hmm. But we do not have a great understanding of it at this point in time. Um, so yes, I think down the road, we're going to find out more about that. But right now, we can't give you specific stuff. The main thing that we always like to say is, like, especially from the cardiology standpoint, keep mm -hmm. a heart healthy diet, you know, you don't want to add yeah. something on top of something else that you already have going on. Um, exactly. You know, keep your heart healthy, that type of thing. Um, but no, not that we know of that eating something is going to make it, you know, better or worse on the gene, that the gene's going to work better or worse. All right. Well, thank you, Lisa, for being here. We appreciate it. Have a great rest yeah. of your day. Thank you so much. Take care, everybody. Uh huh. And this concludes our sem our seminar for today. Um, I want to apologize. <laughs> my, I did not mute my but um, my microphone last uh, session, so I apologize for that. But I do want to thank all the presenters for their time and um, the effort they put in putting their presentations together. And thank you for taking time out on your Saturday to join us. I also want to say thank you again to Amicus Therapeutics for their support. Um, and if anyone from Amicus is on the line, thank you for joining us today. If you have questions, you can email us that there at mdaengage at mdausa.org. And finally, I wanna remind everyone about the survey I'm going to be emailing. If you don't wanna wait, you could take a picture of it with your smart device right there and the QR code will pop up through your camera and will direct you directly to the survey site. So thank you very much for joining us today and have a great rest of your day.